Wonderful. So uh, welcome back to our third plenary session of the day. And uh, for many of us, our sixth session after you've done various uh, breakout rooms. Um, I know I've been really uh, inspired by all the sessions I've been a part of, and um, I'm super excited to introduce and welcome Shane to, to speak to us now. Um, Shane, where are you joining us from? I'm in Philly. I'm home. You're at home in Philly. Oh, wonderful. Well, I'm glad that by the wonders of the internet, you can be with us. Um, I'm particularly excited to welcome Shane because um, I've engaged with a number of his writings and, and lots of his talks over the years and always found it a huge inspiration and encouragement. So I really um, encourage you to check out um, the Red Letter Christian website, or Shane's website, see the various um, amazing and radical things that uh, he has been involved in and continues to be involved in and the, the veritable bookshelf of, um, of works that Shane has produced over the years, the latest of which um, is the book uh, Beating Guns, I believe, is that right? And that, uh, uh, which is sort of picking up that biblical image of, of beating uh, swords into plowshares. Um, my dad is a hobbyist blacksmith, so he's been really excited to um, engage in some of that stuff um, over the last few years. Um, what is uh, wonderful about Shane is he's really not shy at um, you know, engaging with the big issues and uh, speaking politically um, as the church and as faith and thinking, how do we really make a difference and, and um, involved in activism and in, um, and in action as well. So I'm really um, thrilled and excited to be able to hear what you're gonna say to us today, Shane, around this whole area of climate crisis and the church uh, and all that kind of stuff. So um, for those who, uh, yeah, who are also watching this online on YouTube, um, I'd encourage you to, again, check out Shane's stuff um, and share this video so that others can, can hear some of the content that we're, we've been exploring this weekend. Um, Shane, uh, over to you. Uh, we're excited to, to hear what you're going to say. Yeah, thanks so much, y'all. It's great to be with you. And I'm, uh, I'll be watching the chat, too. I like to be as interactive as we can on the Zoom machine. So uh, let me know what vibes with you. And I'm also a, um, I got a little bit of Pentecostal and charismatic roots, so I can use a little amen in the chat here and there. But I, I know we're, we're thinking about, uh, you know, I, I, I thought about uh, the creation care side, what, what we're talking about today. And I just got off the phone with uh, Ebony Twilly Martin, who's the uh, relatively new executive director of uh, Greenpeace, which is awesome. And she's a woman of faith. So it was really cool to hear. You know, I think we're, we're there's lots of, of folks that are making connections of our faith with um, the creation. And, you know, in, in light of the fact that we're kind of talking about imagination and the locality of where we are, I wanted to show you a few pictures uh, as I share, and then we're going to have plenty of time to um, uh, interact and engage each other. Uh, but I think place is really important, um, and all of our spaces look different, so these pictures are not meant to be prescriptive, uh, but more just provocative. Uh, they're not anecdotal, but kind of invitational to, to uh, have each of us thinking about our, our own space and what creation care looks like. As you can probably also hear, I have lots of noise in my space. I've got a jackhammer over here and uh, police sirens over here. And so just to show you um, the world that we're in a little bit, I'm gonna um, throw a few pictures up here. Um, so our community is on the north side of Philadelphia. And some of you may know a little backdrop. I sure don't assume that you do though. So here's a few pictures of our community started in an abandoned Catholic church uh, in the 1990s, back in the 1900s, y'all. That's how old I am. Some of y'all probably weren't even born yet. Um, but uh, these homeless families, mo mothers and children moved into this abandoned cathedral and they began to live there. And um, it was uh, the Catholic church that gave them an eviction notice and said that they could be arrested for trespassing on the church property, even though it was abandoned. And that sparked the student movement. 
um, that we kind of moved in in solidarity with those families. Uh, and they hung a banner on the front of it that said, how can we worship a homeless man on Sunday and ignore one on Monday? Hallelujah. And uh, that's, that's uh, kind of how we started. So over the years, we've built a community in this neighborhood and uh, you know, it has everything to do with creation care and bringing abandoned space back to life. So I always thought it was kind of ironic that we started in an abandoned church. Uh, and, and sometimes we say that good, good stuff comes from the compost, uh, even the compost of Christendom and the ruins of the abandonment of, of the church, you know, kind of in our neighborhood. So we got married there, Katie and I, that's my homemade suit. Uh, that my mom helped make. So we make, you know, make a lot of our own clothes and grow a lot of our own food and whatnot. But that was our wedding uh, there with, uh, we got permission to go back into the abandoned church to get married because that could have ended badly if the wedding crashers came. So, and this is our block. Um, so you can see kind of where we live and also the sense of really vibrant community that we built here over the last 20 years. That's our tandem bike. That was our stretch limousine for our wedding that's hanging up over here in our living room. But this is also our neighborhood. So, um, you know, when I was in seminary, people talked a lot about exegeting scripture. And by that, they meant, you know, let's read the scripture in the context it was written. Let's try to hear the scripture with first century ears. But I think we also have to exegete our time and place. And, and by that, uh, ask the question, what does it look like to uh, live out the gospel in this space? What does it look like to seek a renewed creation? Uh, one of my neighbors said it really well. She said, I get what we're doing. And I said, what? And she said, we're trying to bring the Garden of Eden to North Philadelphia. So that's kind of good theology. That's sort of what we're trying to do is bring space back to life. And we've got a lot of abandoned uh, buildings, vacant factories like this one, but we've also got a lot of life. And for us, you know, life kind of happens in the streets with the open fire hydrants and community happens on the sidewalk. These are a few of the kids and families that we've been building community with over the years. We do a lot of um, community building like Bible. This is Bible study. Um, we do a lot of meals together. Um, celebrations this is mother's day where we celebrated our mothers block parties this is our back to school party where you know about a thousand kids can show up and be celebrated and we can have water slides and liability insurance and whatnot uh this is one of the best jugglers in the world that came here and uh set the world record for the most apples sliced while juggling machetes pretty awesome world record. So that was set right on our block. And I, I chose some of these to say that, you know, we believe in joy. And I think that we believe in art and imagination. And we need some of that, especially as we tackle some of these big issues like um, creation care. But we also believe, you know, uh, that as the early Christian said, resurrection was not just one event 2000 years ago but it's something that changes everything for us because we live out resurrection every day. We practice resurrection. We bring abandoned space to life. So this is a little of what that looks like now for us. We can get abandoned, we get abandoned houses and we make them, uh, turn them into homes. Uh, so that's kind of a before and after there of abandoned space brought back to life. We take vacant lots and turn them into gardens. Um, and, we, you know, so this is creation care uh, in a real way. Those, those flowers back there are made out of hubcaps, you know, so we're trying to reclaim trash. We're trying to uh, bring lots back to life. Um, and, and we're up against a lot of really daunting principalities and powers. I use that word, you know, it's a scriptural word. I don't know if everybody's church people here today, but uh, that we really believe that there are forces at work that are crushing people's lives and this was one of those moments where that became real with a terrible fire 10 years ago that started in one of the city-owned abandoned factories it burnt our whole block down so a lot of what we had built over 10 years here burnt to the ground and so we had to practice resurrection again 
Uh, this is what it looked like after the fire, and this is what it looks like uh, now. We we began calling that space Phoenix Park, you know, because a phoenix rises from the ashes, and that's what happened on that lot. And we began to reclaim that space where we we um, grow a lot of food for our neighborhood. Um, we've got a lot of murals like this one. You might recognize this one. This is Banksy, of course. We counterfeited it. Don't tell him. And uh, it says at the bottom, thanks Banksy on it. And it's a couple of kids standing on a pile of guns and weapons. Um, so that's actually the side of my house right here. But we've got a lot of beautiful images and a lot of them have that kind of creation care of the rain and the sun uh, growing food together. Uh, this is one of our murals that has a little bit more theology. You can see maybe at the top, the. Um, lion and the lamb and the dove, the rolled away stone. And uh, in this one, we, we learn, you learn as you go. And we learned that painting, painting a, a mail container is a federal crime uh, in America. So uh, who knew? And we, we, uh, they, were, they went gentle on us. So we, we, we uh, learned not to paint the mail containers though. So there you go. And this is just a, some of the creation, you know, the, the stuff that we're growing. We've experimented with all kinds of urban farming and gardening. We've got grapevines that are now 10 years old. We've, we're uh, grow, seeing some of our cardinals and other birds that have come back to the neighborhood. We're trying to grow milkweed, which is one of the um, sole nourishments for monarch butterflies, which we now see. So that kind of the Garden of Eden meeting uh, Eden, you know, coming to North Philadelphia is what we're trying to do. And it's, it's very spiritual work, you know, as um, one of the kids, actually, the on the on the left here came to my house one day and was banging on the door. And I was first startled because I thought there was an emergency or something. But then he dragged me down the block to show me a firefly, uh, you know, lightning bugs. And he's like, what is that? It was the first time that we had had fireflies in our neighborhood. And I said, uh, that was a great day for God. God made a bug that's butt glows in the dark. You know, how cool is that? And there's, there's a sense of wonder about it all, right? And I think, you know, what we've realized is that it's hard to retain that sense of wonder when everything that you look at is ugly and broken and crushed by those principalities and powers. So uh, every day, this uh, work of creation care is... Uh, a, a spiritual rebuttal, uh, you know, a rebuke of the kind of things that are destroying life and the corporations and the uh, policies that are devastating people's lives. So uh, we're trying new things all the time. Some of them work, some of them don't, but, you know, there's an aquaponic system that we've uh, gone through different phases of trying to grow fish underground and um, uh, plants on top of that. Uh, so those are uh, some of our high-tech experiments. It's some of our Swiss chard that we were able to distribute. We're giving out hundreds and hundreds of bags of food, and it's always best when it's grown on our block. Um, and that's our prayer on our front door. Heal all that is broken in our hearts, in our streets, and in our world. So we very much connect what we're doing locally with the movement work that so many of you are a part of, too, uh, to try to heal uh, this, this world, the, the creation itself. Um, and, and so this is some of the organizing that we've done. We had to reclaim that abandoned lot that uh, where the fire started. So this is where the factory burnt down our block. And um, we were able to, over many years, to reclaim that space. And we're now building a community center uh, on that land. Um, we really had to push the city to donate that land. And we've partnered with a lot of other groups and uh, our friends are building a wonderful community center there that has a gym and um, all kinds of resources and a, a clinic and, um, and things like that. But we're, um, we're, we also you know, believe in sort of the prophetic work. Um, Martin Luther King uh, is a great inspiration to me. And one of the things that Dr. King said is that the church is not meant to be the master of the state or the servant of the state. The church is meant to be the conscience, the conscience of our uh, society. 
And so we're always asking, how can we expose injustice in ways that make it uncomfortable so that people have to respond and take action? And one of those in our neighborhoods is our opioid crisis. So in all of our gardens and all of our spaces on our sidewalks, we find these needles and we lose a hundred lives every day, uh, every year, uh, actually 1200 last year to heroin and opioid overdoses. And so we began to, uh, inspired by our young people, we had a campaign called Need a Little Help, where we bottled up the needles uh, and we carried them and delivered them to our city officials. So we took them to the mayor and the health commissioner um, and all of our city council members, a jar with their name on it, and we asked for their help. And we had a, an emergency response that we're still trying to get more robust teeth on it, but um, uh, to try to respond to the opioid crisis. Uh, and so our kids were the heroes, they were courageous. They delivered those jars of needles and the city officials st still tell me that they've got those jars on the, on the walls of their office to remind them of the urgency of what's at stake. Uh, just a couple other images that kind of distantly relate to the, you know, kind of intersections of creation care, but we're trying to be a conscience around immigration in our country. Uh, so we have a lot of churches that have signs like this. This is uh, LaSalle Street Church in Chicago. Of course, we welcome refugees. We're Christians. <laughs> we kind of like the, uh, the unashamed uh, uh, just directness of that. And we've done a lot of actions like this. This is in Congress where a number of us were arrested for praying by name uh, for refugee families and calling our government to respond more passionately and hospitably to immigrants and refugees. So we were taken to jail and one of those officers whispered to me, uh, many of us are with you. And I did ask him why he was arresting us then. Um, but anyway, you know, we, we try to bear witness on these. We're working hard to abolish the death penalty um, we're working on the, the climate crisis, as many of you are, you know, to bring attention to the environmental crisis. And I see these protests, you know, as a way of creating public liturgy, uh, you know, worship in the streets of bearing witness. And there's many, many ways that people are doing that on climate crisis. Uh, this is a, a demonstration holding the names of all the people our government is executed. Mm -hmm. um, to, together with victims of violence, uh, violent crimes and murder vi victims as well. Um, and finally, we've been, um, you know, doing a lot of work around gun violence. And uh, as you know, we kind of mentioned, you might be able to see the picture too of uh, I'm holding up a shovel here of, you know, some of the, the, the garden tools that we make out of guns. And you'll see a few pictures of those, but we've created um, installations like this one um, where we have the names and ages of everyone who's dying from gun violence in our city. Last year, it was over 500 lives just in Philadelphia, 40,000 lives uh, uh, lost to guns in our country last year. So we're creating ways of publicly lamenting that and grieving it in, you know, in our streets. And we're doing that uh, work that I like to say, we're not just protesting, but we're protestifying. We're, we're proclaiming how things can be made different. And so the work of turning guns into garden tools is a part of that. This is an AK-47 that we turned into uh, garden tools here. You'll see um, a shovel and a rake. And that was our first gun. We've been doing it for 10 years. And now we've got uh, images like this one from all over the world of people that have made guns into musical instruments. Um, this is in Mozambique, where they made saxophones from guns. This is in Najaf in Iraq, where they poured guns in the streets and they ran over them with bulldozers and uh, uh, said the children need to lead us into a different future because the adults are failing us right now. And uh, so the kids crushed the guns. And uh, this is in Philadelphia, um, a handgun that we found in one of the abandoned houses. And we, uh, we turned that into garden tools. Um, and um, so we're, we're doing that work uh, all the time of uh, beating guns into garden tools and 
and also calling out that this, the, you know, the prophetic image that we will beat swords into plows and spears into pruning hooks ends by saying nation will not rise up against nation. We will study war no more. But it's also this image of a restored creation that we see in the new Jerusalem images in Revelation that uh, we don't go back to the Garden of Eden, but the, the, the Bible ends with a restored creation. And the new Jerusalem is a city where the river of life runs through it. And I'm pretty sure the river isn't polluted. Uh, the tree of life flourishes and people are able to live without fear. So, uh, you know, Walter Brueggemann, who's a great scholar and a dear friend, he wrote a book called The Prophetic Imagination. And he said that in, in that book, he kind of suggests that we often misunderstand the biblical prophets. And we think that the prophets were trying to predict the future, that they were fortune tellers. But that's not quite it. Uh, and and Brueggemann, you know, says that they weren't trying to predict the future. They were trying to change the future. And the prophets were not fortune tellers. They were truth tellers. They were trying to wake us up uh, and, and invite us to imagine a future that's different from the one that we're headed towards right now. And, and so that's really what this prophetic work is about. And I think we certainly need it on climate, uh, on the environmental crisis and climate change. We need to find new ways of being that conscience that wakes people up uh, to the urgency of what's at stake right now um, and invites people to uh, imagine a future where we do live without fear, where uh, guns and knives are converted from instruments of killing into instruments of cultivating life and caring for life. Uh, and, and, and that's the work, I think the hard work, you know, uh, that we want to do uh, when it comes to like protestifying and proclaiming that another world is possible. Uh, and, and that's the work, you know, I think when it comes to Christianity, uh, many people have um, rejected a version of Christianity that is just kind of using and exploiting faith um, uh, as a ticket into heaven and ignoring the world that we live in right now. And when I read the things that Jesus said, he's not just talking about the kingdom of God is something we go up to when we die, but something we are to usher in uh, on earth as it is in heaven uh, to bring God's dream on our block, in our city, you know, into our world to participate actively in bringing the dream of God on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, and not just to uh, promise people that they can go to heaven when they die while ignoring the hells that they're living in right now. Um, and I believe in life after death, uh, but I also believe in life before death. And I think we're losing a lot of people to Christianity because they find Christianity irrelevant if all that we have is the promise that they can go to heaven when they die. And I believe that, that God is much more... Um, uh, much bigger than that, you know, that, that, that we are to try to care about the world that we live in right now. And a lot of this theology has terrible implications, right? I heard uh, one pastor say, I was going to mention their name, but I'm not going to mention their name. <laughs> uh, that they said, you know, I drive an SUV because this world is not our home. And in fact, if driving an SUV might expedite the apocalypse, then so be it. If it quickens the second coming of Jesus, then uh, I might be uh, living on the right side of, of the climate crisis. So that's obviously extreme, but really messed up theology. But it's that kind of thing that is what some people have heard from Christianity. Um, because some of the loudest voices some of the most toxic voices have hijacked the headlines. And so I want to be one of those Christians that's trying to sing a better song, right? That's trying to live out a version of our faith that is connected to this world, that actually has its feet um, in a neighborhood in real life um, and is not just talking theology, but that's trying to put flesh on it. And in the end, you know, that's what one of my neighbors said is that uh, 
she speaks Spanish as her first language. And uh, she said uh, in Spanish, you know, in English, a lot of people talk incarnational theology, the incarnation. Jesus was God with skin on. And she says, in Spanish, con carne means with meat. Uh, when you order your burrito con carne, uh, it means with meat. And that's what Jesus does for us, is put meat on God's love, put flesh on God's love. And now we are to be the body of Christ the flesh and blood of God's love alive in the world. We're to, we're to really put meat on uh, God's love and to live in concrete ways so that people can see uh, God's love in action and God's love restoring the creation that is so uh, terribly uh, broken and abused because of the way that we've treated it. And uh, so I'll stop there. I, I've talked a fair amount. I'd love to give us a minute to pause and uh, I'll watch the chat. And then I would love to leave plenty of time for conversation because uh, I don't think we learn best through monologue, but through dialogue. So thanks for letting me show some of our pictures and share a few stories. I've got my tea here, not my coffee, because I know my audience and uh, I'm excited to uh, talk with all of you. So thank you. I'm glad you have the tea. That is the, the correct thing. Although we've got people from you know, South Africa, America, Canada, all over. So um, yeah, beverage, beverage of choice. Um, thank you so much, Shane. It's so inspiring to um, see, particularly some of those four before and after pictures um, coming up while people are sort of formulating some of their questions and getting them into the chat. I'd love to hear, um, I'd love to kind of ask you how for those people who are sort of looking at those and thinking, gosh, there's just so much there, so much exciting, big stuff, but I just can't see that happening in my neighborhood, in my place. I can't see me being able to start something like that. What, what would you say to, to those sorts of people? Uh, so first, you know, like I said early on, I don't, I don't want to be anecdotal or say people need to do what we're doing, but I think all of us can start where we are and say, you know, what are the principalities and powers that are crushing people's lives? Um, what does environmental racism uh, and, and the environmental crisis look like in our, our area? Um, what it, you know, and I, I think that we can also um, have a lot of different creative ideas. You know, I mean, um, I've learned from visiting communities all over the world some of the things that we're doing here, you know, like the, uh, we've got vermicomposting, we've got, uh, you know, worms that we're, we're using to cultivate our soil. We've got uh, all kinds of little things that we've gleaned from other places. Um, but, you know, sometimes I think we get, um, we, we, we think this is about, you know, big stuff, but when I, I've been to the Holy Land, I don't know if you've been through those places that we read about in the Bible. But when you go to Capernaum, for instance, one of the things that struck me is how little this town is. I mean, this is like 400 families live there. And, and this is the, Caper the Capernaum, you know, of scripture. These proper pronouns, you know, they're real places, but they're also little towns just like yours and just like mine. And the gospel is very small in a lot of ways. I like how Dorothy Day of the Catholic Worker Movement, she, she said, our goal is not to get bigger and bigger, but to grow smaller and smaller. And the images that we have of the reign of God, the kingdom of God, they're things like mustard seed, which was sort of an invasive plant uh, that, that took over the garden, you know? Uh, they're things like yeast and leaven and light. Those are the metaphors that we have for the kingdom of God and they're almost invisible. They're, they give you this kind of vision of, uh, of, of this sort of um, beautiful, humble, modest uh, spreading of love and grace in real spaces. Uh, but then I do think that we've got to find ways that we can join with a larger movement to have public actions that can stir people's hearts and minds uh, around the environmental crisis. Um, and, and so some of those are a little, you know, one of the things that we've, we've got is a, um, 
uh, you know, on our block parties, we have a sound system that runs off of a stationary bike so that you've got to ride the bike in order to have uh, the, the amplification work. Uh, so, you know, we can, we can create little creative ways that we, um, it's not just our message, but it's the method is it kind of embedded in everything that we do too, you know? So when we travel, um, we've traveled off of, uh, I, tra I did a whole tour off of a bus that ran off of waste vegetable oil. So we, you know, had to sift the oil and we're, we're running the bus off veggie oil. Katie and I, for the last year, we lived off of a bus that had solar panels and a composting toilet. So um, I think we can be creative with how we live, but we've also got to kind of be that prophetic voice uh, as well. I see, you know, the question folks asking who the we is, and I, you know, we, we've got a lot of layers of we, because um, I started the simple way along with a handful of my college uh, friends um, and those families that were homeless. Uh, but we've been building a village here for 20 years. So the we is really big and there's lots of layers. We, we sometimes describe like layers of an onion uh, that exists within our community. But then in the larger movement around the death penalty, gun violence, there's all kinds of people that are involved. And that's what Red Letter Christians is, is I, I say the best articulation of who we are at Red Letter Christians is a web of subversive friends who love Jesus and who care about justice. And we're always looking for new friends. Uh, so, you know, please go to join, join what we're doing. There's uh, Red Letter Christians UK, there's Red Letter Christians in lots of other countries. Uh, and certainly, you know, we, we started here in the States, uh, but uh, you know, one of the things that you see on our website is this sort of sense of a cloud of witnesses of lots of different people that are doing really creative things right where they are. Um, so we're trying to, you know, kind of put those voices together uh, and, and we're, you know, so, so you can see a lot of great leaders on there too. So I'm having a hard time keeping up with the chat. So I'll look to you uh, to keep us uh, talking there, brother. Luke. Yeah, now I can see lots of nods and thumbs up and things like that coming up in the little pictures at the top. So, um, Justin, do you, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Just in the chat, you have one. Sure. Yeah. Thank you so much, Shane. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned in the chat, my sister lives in that uh, area that you're showing pictures of. She lives in Kensington. And um, so I just had a question about some of the challenges. She was part of Circle of Hope and some of the stuff that was going on there. And the big challenge that everyone seems to be facing in the urban setting in particular is gentrification. So there were all these like really inspiring community projects going on like 20 years ago when she moved into the area and some of those urban gardens and reclaiming spaces. Uh, but gentrification is sort of like decommunified a lot of those neighborhoods now where the people that had the greatest stake in the neighborhood are now priced out. Uh, and you have young professionals who aren't as concerned or you have investors and all of that. Like how has that impacted sort of some of this Garden of Eden um, sort of vision and like what have you guys done to deal with that kind of stuff? Yeah, thanks, man. And um, uh, so uh, I'll, I'll just give a few, you know, thoughts on it because there's, there's entire groups that are thinking about this, you know, um, in Philadelphia, we've got a coalition called development without displacement. So we want to see development done responsibly, but not in a way that displaces people. So there's a few things that we do. And one of those is our new emphasis on affordable housing is to try to create and secure uh, owner occupied homeowners in our neighborhood that can earn, own their first home. Uh, we use a model for that that's worked all over the world and all over our country. Um, uh, we, Millard Fuller, who started Habitat for Humanity, also started another organization called Fuller Housing. So what we do is connected to that larger network and it's called Simple Homes. And I'll put it in the chat. You can check out our affordable housing movement there. But the model is 
that we kind of say, we won't build a house for you, but we'll build a house with you. So we acquire the abandoned house, we finance everything, and we sell the houses for $35,000 US. Um, that's pretty cheap. Um, and we uh, have no interest on the home. Uh, so all the house payments are paying that off. We customize the monthly payment to fit the income. So it's uh, maybe $500 a month, cheaper than most people are renting for. Uh, and we, we just help secure those houses. Um, and that, that's working really well. The families also do sweat equity. So they put 350 hours into their home. So they're very invested in the home. They're also building a social network. Um, so, you know, they're learning to do sheetrock and they, they know our, you know, our friend Bill. So when, if there's a plumbing problem five years later, they've got uh, someone that they know that they can call on to help out. Uh, so it's very comprehensive. But then as we're securing affordable housing, we're also trying to have some policy changes. So things like we have a homestead law that locks in the real estate taxes and the value of the house. So that keeps a lot of people from being displaced because what happens is they, they can't afford to continue to live in the neighborhood because the, um, the taxes increase. So it locks those in so that they don't increase. Uh, that's a good law. We have things like a development um, uh, a tax. So this, this was started by responsible developers who said we need to be giving back to the neighborhoods that we're making profits off of. And it's a very reasonable tax that they agreed on for, for folks that flip houses within two years, there's a 2% tax on the profit. So it's very reasonable, but it generates $12 million a year that goes towards affordable housing. So those are just a few examples. We've got to keep thinking preemptively about those things. Uh, we're a long way from where gentrification is in other areas of our city, but we're trying really hard to like, um, think ahead rather than react once it comes. Uh, mixed income housing laws that don't allow for um, a whole unit of affordable housing, but they make sure that there's mixed income in every housing unit, but it also means that you can't just build a bunch of fancy condos or studio apartments. You've got to have section eight or affordable housing integrated into it. So it's a big question. There's other pieces of the puzzle, but, uh, uh, and we haven't figured it all out. We still make mistakes, but those are all things that we're, we're working on. Thanks a lot. Yeah. I mean, I have more questions, but I'll uh, put it to the group. Call on me, Luke, if you need me. I'm sure there'll be uh, plenty of time. One of the things that strikes me as you're talking, Shane, is how um, creation care poverty and economics and violence and community, all of these things are sort of interwoven, not, not separate and feed in. Would you mind talking about how some of those are other elements for you are particularly significant for the whole issue of sort of climate crisis and, and climate care and going forwards? Um, yeah, it just seems that as you speak, they seem quite woven together, but I'd love to hear you talk about that a bit more explicitly if you're able. Yeah, so, uh... The, the, you know, Kimberly Crenshaw and others have, have named the intersectionality of these issues. So there's so many different overlapping injustices, or as the, we say in the Poor People's Campaign here, the interlocking injustices are kind of bound up together. And the Poor People's Campaign um, names like five of those, including environmental uh, injustice, environmental racism. So the impact of climate change and of, of the environmental ecological crisis can be felt in real neighborhoods uh, like this one or like Camden across the river where at one point had the most super fun sites uh, of any zip code um, and brownfield. So these were like uh, absolutely poison toxic sites. And then you see that, you know, really um, uh, the, the results of the product of that being disproportionate numbers of African-American kids and kids in poverty that have asthma um, and, and chronic illnesses, places like in, in, in um, 
the southern part of the United States, we buried the Agent Orange that was used uh, in weapons of mass destruction and used in war. It's buried in a poor black community where there's now a group called Jesus People Against Pollution. Uh, but they see the cancer rates, they see the, this, this toxin that was buried uh, in their neighborhood. And now, so the war economy and the ecological devastation and racism, environmental racism, all are really, you know, bound up. And I'm sure, I'm sure that there are ways that you see that, you know, in your own context, but that's kind of how we see it here. Um, and, you know, every, every dollar that's spent on military is not spent on our schools and our health care and the things that we desperately need too. So these, these things kind of uh, uh, are bound together. As Dr. Martin Luther King said, uh, a country that continues to spend more money on military defense than on social uplift is approaching a spiritual death. Um, so we, we see that, I mean, literally our schools not only don't have healthy food sometimes, but they even don't have, our school doesn't even have air conditioning. So it has to let out when it gets over a hundred degrees. I can't translate the Celsius, but that's hot, very hot. And kids can't concentrate when it's a hundred degrees. Um, like I, we don't have air conditioning, but we're spending uh, money on, we have the capacity of 50,000 Hiroshima bombs, you know? And so it, it just becomes mind boggling, you know, but you see how these things connect to each other. Great, thank you. Um, I think Ben uh, has, uh, he wanted to raise it, he had raised a topic in the chat and just agreed to, to unmute and, and raise, we can chat about it a bit more in the main talk to Ben, if you want to unmute. Sure, thank you. Uh, Shane, great to hear what you're saying. Thank you, huge encouragement. Um, I was drawn to what you were talking about in terms of activism. Whoops, I think we lost you for just sorry, a second there. Sorry, Ben, I, I went to um, put you on spotlight and muted you instead by accident. <laughs> no, that's fine, you know, by the way. Um, you were talking about activism and there were those scenes of you being arrested. Within the UK presently, um, being arrested and having a criminal record for standing with someone like Extinction Rebellion can block you from entering ordained ministry in the Church of England because we still have this very straight-laced concept that we must be uh, better than perfect. Um, shoot me down on that one, anyone, please. And um, so it can be a real challenge. There's a cost to this prophetic action of demonstrating, of standing in the shoes of others and with others, and, um, and that importance of actually speaking with a prophetic voice into difficult, uh, painful and challenging situations, but it becomes a blocker. How does that, what's your experience of that? Wow, well, that's a great and important question. Good heavens. I, I think I gotta like, I'm gonna just text uh, Justin Welby here. I didn't know that that was a true, I'm just kidding, sort of. Um, but I, I think I didn't, I had no idea that that was the case. Um, wow. We might have some work to do on that. Um, I mean, I, I want to say that I don't think getting arrested is uh, the only way to make a point, but there sure is a rich tradition of civil disobedience and direct action uh, for Christians leading all the way back to the sweet Lord Jesus himself and many of the disciples and martyrs and, uh, you know, Christians through history. Uh, I mean, you know, we... And, Trans got to translate a little bit the Boston Tea Party over here in the U.S. and the civil rights movement, but you know you've got your own forms of uh, the Bonhoeffers and uh, Wilberforce and you know those who ended slavery, the fall of apartheid. Also, I think we've got all of these you know social movements through throughout history. Many of them were led by people of faith. So um, yeah, I th I think that the the fusion of church and state that you have in um I, I don't assume every not everybody's in the uk on the call or are we uh we were in several different countries is that right but like um uh that's okay so you all look at the united states right and you go what is up with guns and the death penalty my gosh like how haven't you moved on and i think in some ways we look at the church and state thing over there and watch the crown and all that and we're like what in the world is up with this 
church and state thing, you know? Um, and I say that as one who, who is, has great admiration for, you know, Archbishop Justin Welby. He's a dear friend. We've done a ton of stuff together and I've stayed there in Lambert Palace. But, you know, every time I'm over there, my head's just kind of spinning with the like kind of um, ways that you see that uh, church and state. You know, as my friend Tony Campolo says, when you mix the, the church and state, it's kind of like mixing ice cream and horse manure it doesn't really mess up the manure, but it really messes up the ice cream, you know? And, and so uh, that is confusing. So anyway, back to the question about direct action. I think there's all kinds of ways that we can turn up the volume for love and grace. And getting arrested is not always the most effective way. Uh, in fact, there's actions that shut people down rather than opening people up. And so I think the question is always, how can we raise the, turn up the volume of urgent, so uh, our Archbishop doesn't hear that part, I guess, or something, but anyway, uh, so uh, no, but you know, I, I think we can turn up the volume and still have humility, still have gentleness. In fact, you know, when you study direct actions, it's often the contrast between the violence that we're trying to expose and the nonviolence of those who are protesting in the streets that is how we challenge those laws and policies. Um, so we've done that in so many different forms. I mean, we took medicine to Iraq during the war and it was illegal. We faced the possibility of 12 years in jail for taking medicine uh, to Iraq. We didn't end up doing any time or anything, but I think the whole point was like, it is our job to uphold good laws. And it's just as much our job to disobey and to challenge bad laws and policies. Uh, you know, as, as, as Augustine said, an unjust law is no law at all. Um, so yeah, and then, you know, someone brought up the needles. This was, no one got arrested. Like this was not, we, I mean, we had children with us. So there was, no, we, our, our goal in doing the need a little help campaign was to expose the urgency but no one was going to go to jail. And um, there's a lot of other ways that we, we do that. So, um, you know, while civil disobedience and going to jail uh, has a place, I believe, and even a theologically defensible place. And that's why I do support um, uh, the, the work of groups that are doing that. Um, I think there's lots of other tactics, strategies, and effective ways of turning up the volume of urgency. And sometimes getting arrested can distract from the people that we want to highlight. So the question is always, how do we make sure that those directly impacted are the ones uh, that, that the spotlight is on? Because I think the best way that we are uh, moving people in their hearts uh, is by making this personal uh, and showing how it impacts real people and to creation itself, you know, so there's probably lots of ways we could do that. But um, thanks for a really good question. And sorry, I can't answer all your start state church questions, but we did write a whole book wrestling with those called Jesus for President. Um, that's getting re-released in the U.S. because I think that they like we got all this Christian nationalism that's just on a, you know, surging. And so I think my publisher thinks people might pick up Jesus for president and not get the joke. So let's just, uh, let's get it back out there. So we're putting it back out again, but anyway, yeah. Thanks, um, thanks Shane. Yes, yeah, so, uh, lots going on in the chat um, as people reflecting over how, you know, some people that there are greater risks with um, getting arrested if you're an immigrant uh, with citizenship in the UK, for instance, that can affect that. I know, um, uh, you know, whatever you think of Extinction Rebellion, I know often within their direct protest that they will actually have people they almost nominate as being the ones who will potentially get arrested and then others who are supporting and, you know, will pick them up from the police station and will do other roles. So I guess that that's the, another role of community and direct action. Um, a question I'd love to love to ask off the back of those is how do you pitch it so that direct action um, continues to keep people on side rather than alienates them from the very cause you're trying to argue for. I mean, Extinction Rebellion, as one example, have sometimes been quite unpopular from the nature of some of their um, 
they, some of their protests in the UK, millions of drivers who might agree with them, but, but struggle with the tactics. How do, you, how do you balance that, almost that public relations side of direct action so that you're not hurting yourself, you are sort of furthering the cause? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And I don't want to be, uh, I don't want to speak too much to the Extinction Rebellion because I've not been intricately involved in that. But I, I don't think that it needs to be about just that. But the question is kind of, um, you know, what's, what's effective? Um, and there is this dance between uh, disruption um, in, in saying there is a place for disruption because there is a crisis. I mean, Martin Luther King said, traffic lights are good things. We need traffic lights. But when a fire is blazing, the emergency vehicles go through the red light uh, and nor you know, business as normal stops. And some would argue that the climate crisis is that kind of fire blazing right now that you don't just go on with business as usual. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think that, um, that, that I'm still very much um, an evangelical at heart, and I want to win more and more people over to the movement, um, whether that's the you know movement around the ecological crisis or the death penalty. And there can be a way that our actions come across as morally self-righteous um, and um, uh, kind of shaming everyone else or something. So I think that's why we always try to have it more as a lament and a grieving and beautiful and uh, provocative. Um, and there's lots of ways that we've done that, um, you know, over the years of organizing. Um, um, and then let's make it inconvenient for the people who have decisions to make. That's why, you know, when, when we have blocked doors, it's often been at the, the seats of those who have the power to change something not just drivers in the streets. Um, uh, so there is a strategic decision there, you know. Um, uh, we, um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I, I think that, that that's maybe enough, but I think the, the more that we can center the voices of people impacted. So for instance, when we were arrested uh, in the Capitol around immigration, that whole event began with dreamers, young immigrant families that shared their stories. And they were the center of attention. They could not risk arrest, but they saw the value, especially in clergy and faith leaders risking arrest. And so we went into the halls of Congress and kneeled down in prayer. I think that's important too, is the posture that we were arrested in was one of prayer. And we were literally reading the names and the prayers of 3,000 immigrant families that had written them on post-it notes. Um, and, and that was our witness. So that, I think a lot of hearts were opened up. As I said, you know, um, even the police officers seemed really moved by that witness, even though they were inconvenienced, you know, uh, by it. Uh, so that's just, you know, a few thoughts. Great, thank you. Um, one of the, uh, questions in the chat earlier which has a little bit of conversation around with what what's the what do you think the role of sort of the traditional church is, you know, by which i think we mean sort of the the small sunday congregation um uh you know what's what's their role in in all of this and particularly i guess in relation to some of the creation care and, um action stuff well, uh, Jesus said the wheat and the weeds, it all grows together, you know, and I think we can see that in the institutional church too, uh, that it, uh, on almost every issue, the church is simultaneously um, faithful and unfaithful. Uh, the wheat and the weeds are together. We're often the ones who are both defending slavery and working to abolish it. So there's competing narratives, um, and the institutional church is a part of that. Um, on the climate crisis, I think it's the same. There are incredible leaders, like I mentioned, you know, Ebony Martin, uh, the the co-executive director of Greenpeace, who's a, a deeply committed Christian, 
Uh, there's folks in all kinds of organizations that are leading the way on climate crisis and in the streets on it. Uh, and there are churches that are still a part of the problem. Uh, there's leaders that are still a part of the problem. Um, and so the wheat and the weeds are all growing together. And this is where I would say that um, like courage looks different in different spaces. So it looks a little different for Justin Welby to show courage than it might look, it might have a different expression that it has for me. But we're all trying to be courage, courageous where we are. Uh, the Methodist church, which I think has missed the ball on some things, um, has one of the most powerful statements on the death penalty. The Methodist church says that the death penalty, capital punishment, denies the power of Jesus to restore, redeem, and transform every human being. So when a, when a denomination makes a statement like that, it can be really powerful. I mean, statements are also just statements without, you know, some kind of teeth on them. But um, uh, I'm really proud of the church th that there's many leaders that are in the forefront on the death penalty, racial justice, environmental justice, uh, in the U gun violence right now, even as Christians are also a part of the problem. So, um, and we, you know, when I look at Jesus, he's not writing off the institutions. Uh, I mean, he, he's also obviously God, but he's also going to synagogue. He's practicing Passover. He's um, flipping table in the temple sometimes, but he's also calling out the best of our faith. Um, and he's also healing with mud and spit. So he's working outside of the institutions, but also inside of them. And my perspective was, would be that we need to be doing both too. We need to work inside the institutional church to, to conjure up as many acts of courage in many different forms as we can. And we also need to be doing stuff outside of the church that uh, people that are hung up in the institutions may not be freed up to do. Great. Well, I think you've already inspired a bit of direct action in the chat. I think um, there's a group who seems to be um, planning to blockade Downing Street as we speak. So um, we'll see. We'll see what happens from that. Uh, carry on. You know, get each other's details over the chat and, and organize that. Sounds great. Um, John uh, raised a question and that, around that witness will be most powerful too. If Justin Welby will, if the Archbishop would uh, join you in the streets. So. I'll be there and we'll just try to get as many people as we can. How about it? Hallelujah. Well, great. He's your mate. So if you want to get in touch with him and get him on board, then uh, I'll be down there in a shot. <laughs> so uh, um, no, that sounds wonderful. Um, uh, John was raising a point, which I'm really glad someone asked this question. because I'm a bit of a student of new monasticism and, and obviously the simple way has had a really significant role within that whole conversation and pioneering the way on that side, um, particularly in the States, but very much around the world. Um, and John's asking, what, what's, what does the role of eating together play in your community? Yeah, well, it's, it's uh, eating together is one of the things that Jesus did, right? I mean, you think of so many of these things where, you know, the gospel was lived out of dinner tables and living rooms. And you see so much. I mean, his first miracle was turning uh, water into wine to keep a party going. Um, and, you know, he's he's. Uh, part of what you get the sense of is that maybe one of the most radical things that Jesus did was eat with all the wrong people and bring people together for dinner that would never eat together, like a Pharisee and a tax collector and a zealot and a marginalized woman, uh, that all of these folks are forging friendships and they're, they're becoming, you know, they're being made new together as a family. So, um, I, I think that's one of the things that we do is find ways that we, we eat together. Um, and of, of course, it's no coincidence that one of the holiest things we do in the church is communion. Uh, and and um, there's a whole, you know, you could write a whole book on the fact that Jesus comes to us as bread and wine. In fact, we've written about this, you know, that it's not bread and water, but it's the staple food of the poor with the luxurious food of often, you know, those who have money to afford it, um, that come together. And, uh, and, and, and so it's people that are transcending class 
and economics and are uh, uh, becoming a new community together. Uh, so, um, yeah, and if you're not familiar with new monasticism, um, I mean, one of the best places to connect is through the liturgy of common prayer that a few of you have mentioned in the chat. You can find a lot of it just online for free. We gave away as much for free as the publisher would let us, you know, a commonprayer.net. Um, and, uh, but I mean, there's even prayers for dedicating a garden. Um, uh, but there's also like practices each month that we do and really practical things that we invite, you know, each other to think about doing um, as we kind of pray together throughout the year. And we do morning prayer on the first of each month. It will be, you know, in the afternoon for most of you. But um, like this month, it'll be Jonathan Wilson Hartgrove and I who helped compile common prayer together with Michael McBride, who's been an incredible friend and leader uh, and leads a campaign called Live Free uh, here in the U.S. So he'll be with us on August 1st. So you can join us uh, then. And um, it's, it's really great to be praying together and eating together. So I hope, hope I'll be over there soon and I can actually eat with some of y'all. I think, I think I, you know, I can imagine a number of us will be very much up for that. So, you know, do that. Now. How, how, um, how can we remain in touch over events like that? Is it Red Letter Christian the best website to go to to get all that information? Yeah, I'll throw a few more um, in here. And um, I'm really active on social media as well, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. So I put them all on my, my socials too. Uh, but they're also on our mm. webpage, redletterchristians.org. Great. Um, you know, we still got a bit of time. I don't want to sort of bring in a downer, but what, would there be any sort of negative lessons you've learned from the years over things that haven't gone to plan or, or things you regret through um, the building up a community in your local area or through some of the, the larger projects that you've been involved in? Is there things you'd sort of think, oh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that again, or I, I wish we had done this different? Um, what sort of lessons are there from, from the journeys that you've been on? Well, we're learning stuff all the time. You know, we're always, I love that scripture that says we're working out our salvation with fear and trembling. It's not about a moment. It's about a, a real movement in us. And there are times where um, I think we've been better at activism than we've been at prayer. Um, and for a lot of us, prayer has been used as a, as a place to hide, uh, like all of our politicians and many of our preachers. After one mass shooting uh, and another in the U.S., everybody tweets out their thoughts and prayers uh, while not doing anything to actually prevent more lives being lost to guns. So, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't pray. And I think that's why we started things like the Common Prayer Project that are trying to hold those things together and realize that all of this is not a burden just on our shoulders, but we're carrying this with God. We're working with God. God wants our hands, but God is not limited to our hands. And there's, you know, power outside of our own that we need to rely on. So, you know, that, that I don't want to say a balance, but I think it's the integration of prayer and activism is, is something that we, we've been learning um, over the years. I think there's a lot of things like that, that the church tends to emphasize one thing that's true at the expense of another. That's what the heresies often were. They were emphasizing one truth at the expense of another. So um, exaggerating one thing and erasing another. And, and, and in some ways, it's like if you run your car off the left side of the road and you yank the wheel and you run off the right side of the road. Um, so things like um, the Great Commission and the Great Commandment, you know, they got to go together. Faith and works, they're like blades of scissors. And if we separate them, they don't work really well together. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, that's some of, of what we're, we've, I've been learning. Um, uh, sometimes yeah. we ha have a vision of missions that's about outsiders solving problems of the community. So um, we worked hard at that narrative here and to also build community with our neighborhood. Um, mm. And we often say that restoring our neighborhood 
takes three groups of people working together, remainers, returners, and relocators. I'm a relocator, someone outside that moved here. Uh, some of my heroes are the remainers, the indigenous long-term neighbors that have been here longer than me, and returners, folks that grew up here, and maybe they acquired skills or resources that they want to bring back to the neighborhood, so they're returners. But having language that uh, captures that is really important because sometimes the narrative can be, this neighborhood's terrible, and so these people from outside are coming in to, to bring the gospel rather than to find the gospel, you know, and that's a really dangerous and untrue narrative if we're not careful. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, yeah, that, that, uh, that balance of sort of uh, action and contemplation, um, I think is a really key thing within, um, you know, the particularly Christian response to, to everything that's going on, both in climate crisis, in um, economics, in uh, violence, in, in whatever, whatever the, the issue we might be responding to. Um, and on that, on that, on that front, um, uh, one of the things we've, we've done in a couple of other sessions is say, how can we be praying for you? How can we be praying for the Simple Way community? Um, and we'd love to, to be able to do that now as a way of closing our session. Wow. Well, I'm going to be real practical. Um, uh, you could be praying for uh, especially our, our opioid crisis, but also our gun violence. Um, I'm going from this meeting to another one with some of our city officials and a lot of people that are all blaming each other. Um, and the church is trying to be in a presence in the middle of that and to figure out what we can do about it. And our gun violence is just unbelievable, y'all. And I know it's, it blows your mind, but um, you know, we've got a bullet hole in our car. We've got a bullet hole in the front of our house. We've got you know, the, just a, a pile of bullets from the, you know, that we picked up off the streets, just like we have needles. So, and these are lives that are being lost every single day. So pray for the healing of our country. We're in a critical moment uh, in America. I know we're in a critical moment in the world, especially with the ecological crisis, but you could really be praying um, for us. It feels like our country's really fragile right now, uh, very combustible. Um, and, and so what is it? look like to weep with Jesus over Jerusalem, but also to be have the holy anger with which Jesus flipped the table. So I'm always praying that we would uh, have the right cocktail of love and truth um, in everything that we're doing. Um, yeah, right. I'm going to be praying for you all. I had I, I have several takeaways, but one of my is I'm still my mind is blown that if you get arrested, you can't be ordained in the in the Anglican Church. Is that right? I got that right. So, yeah, we got to change that. Let me let me pray and then uh, make some phone. We got to do that's crazy. But I think with this ecological stuff, y'all, we we really got so much work to do because the church needs to be present in all of this. You know. It, uh, and, and we've had so much bad theology that has led us to inaction. The answer to bad theology isn't no theology, but it's good theology. And you all are doing some of the best of it. I know, you know, so much of, of the church is in a better place. You don't have, well, maybe you do have the bad stuff too, but you know, you, you just keep doing it, keep singing a better song. And uh, I mean, I think we are bearing witness of God's love as we do it, you know, part of why people, what people have rejected is not really Christianity, but it's a version of religion that really doesn't sound and look a lot like Jesus anyway. And so um, that's why I tell some folks, you know, if you've rejected one version of Christianity, that might not be the end, but the beginning of a better version. So, you know, let's uh, good things come from the compost. So we'll keep going. But uh, thanks for your prayer. Let me let me pray for you now, and um, and then hopefully you know, everyone else will be continuing to pray for you um, uh, at other points. But ah, oh, mighty God, we thank you uh, that you are deeply uh, involved in our creation and our world and our communities. That you know each and every person by name. That you know those society forgets or overlooks. That you know every um, small, minute part of this world, and you care for it and you love it deeply. We pray that you would move us to, to have that same love 
you'd move us to um, to seek to to give ourselves in love for for your creation, for your world, for each child. And we pray uh, particularly for Shane and, and his community, for all who are invite, involved in the projects and the work and um, the rhythms of their life together, that you'd inspire them and sustain them by your spirit, that you'd give them um, the right mix of love and gentleness, as well as boldness and righteous anger. That you'd help them to be effective in their pursuit of, of looking like and sounding like Jesus, that you'd keep them uh, true to that, that you'd prevent anything that would stray, stray them away from that, that aim and that desire. And we ask, Lord, um, that you would bless each and every one of them uh, as they continue in that work. And we pray for America. We pray for um, the gun violence, um, for the staggering amount of lives that are lost. Um, we pray for all of those uh, who have died and will die today from gun violence uh, in the US and around the world. And we ask that you might, um, you might call your church to um, beat those guns into plowshares, that we would turn violence uh, into cultivation. So we pray you're moved by your spirit, moved by uh, your people and your church to be agents of peace and witnesses of Christ in every corner uh, of each of our respective countries. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Shane, so much. Loads of um, great uh, comments in the chat, just thanking you for making time to come and be with us, for the things that you've shared, for the wisdom that you've offered. Huge amounts for us to be mulling over and chewing over. And I just encourage you again, um, Shane's books are listed in the program on his bio. So if you've loved what he's been saying, if you want to dig in a bit deeper, um, engage with this a bit more, check those out. Check out the websites um, that he's posted um, in the chat. Um, but otherwise, yeah, thank you, Shane. Um, I hope that the meeting goes well with the city officials and um, we'll be praying for that as well. And uh, for everyone else, thank you for joining. And uh, our next session is, is tomorrow at 1.30 British summertime. If you're somewhere else in the world, um, make sure you check when that is. Um, and we're really delighted to be able to have um, Shul Peter join us, uh, who's uh, got some, going to be sharing some amazing stuff. So enjoy your evening and looking forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Um, we're going to stop the recording there and uh, have a lovely night.